Hey everybody, welcome back. This is our fourth and final lecture for muscle tissue histology. And in this lecture, we're gonna be covering the histology and cellular physiology of smooth muscle tissue. This video is sponsored by doc to doc the personal lending platform designed for doctors by doctors. Do you have some big expenses in the near future? Maybe you're moving, applying to residency or fellowship, fixing up your car or home, or starting a new practice. Doc to doc believes that traditional lenders overestimate the risk of lending money to doctors, residents, and medical students, focusing too much on the challenges of their financial past and giving them insufficient credit for the promise of their financial future. Check out Dr. Doc's personal loan options at drdoclending.com slash da Vinci. So we'll round out our discussion of talking about muscle with, by talking about smooth muscle here. So first an overview, it's non-striated. That's because it doesn't contain sarcomeres like skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. It's found throughout the body and it's organized in a variety of different manners and shapes. It has a less dense blood supply and then less, and as a result of that, less myoglobin than skeletal or cardiac muscle, which contributes to a paler appearance. You can see that here and here. The big thing about smooth muscle is it's involuntary. So we have no conscious control over it. It's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So in the nervous system, you have the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. Then you have the peripheral nervous system, which are essentially the peripheral nerves that come off of the central nervous system. And then you have the autonomic nervous system, which is another branch that's involuntary. In it. And then it has a number of nerves that control a number of different functions in the body, everything from respiration to heart rate to peristalsis in the GI tract and on and on. And these are all involuntary functions that keep us alive. And so like we say here, Smooth muscle plays a huge role in that because it has a variety of functions depending on what shape and where it is in the body. And this includes regulating the diameter of epithelial lumens, such as in blood vessels, both when you have vasoconstriction and then you have vasodilation, where you have increase in the lumen size. Also regulating the lumen of the GI tract. This helps contribute to generating peristaltic contractions for peristalsis to move stool through the colon. It also helps regulate the flow through an orifice or a tube, such as a sphincter. And the big thing also to remember versus skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle is that contraction can actually be partial. So it can, you know, like we show here, you know, when you contract smooth muscle cells in a artery, you don't have to contract all the way that you completely shut off the lumen. There can still be some flow through. And then also you can have contraction for a much more extended period of time versus an all or none short duration contraction that you see with skeletal muscle and especially with cardiac muscle. Histologically, smooth muscle cells are surrounded by an external lamina, and this contains type 3 and type 4 collagen, laminin, elastin, and proteoglycans. Some histological features, these are spindle-shaped cells, so they're shaped like this. They're arranged in kind of sheets like this, and they have pale eosinophilic cytoplasm, which again, although they have, don't have sarcomeres, they still have a high concentration of proteins within their cytoplasm, which contributes to this eosinophilic appearance. Big thing here, like many cells in histology, is they have the nucleus can really help you differentiate these, especially versus cardiac and skeletal muscle. So they have a single nucleus versus skeletal muscle has multiple nucleus or multiple nuclei. Cardiac muscle usually has one, sometimes two. And then, but the thing with cardiac and skeletal muscle nuclei is those are round shaped versus smooth muscle, they're elongated. And you can see that here, they're much more elongated like this and like this, and especially in these longitudinal sections. This is a cross section in the esophagus. So in cross section, this is where you gotta be careful. You, you gotta be thinking, this is where you gotta use other tissues and think about where you are in the body because you don't wanna be tripped up and think, oh, this is cardiac muscle or skeletal muscle. You gotta be thinking about where you are. And so right here, this is a cross section of skeletal muscle. You see very densely stained nuclei like this. What you can appreciate here and here is the way you'll see it in cross section is sometimes you have areas in the body such as in the GI tract especially. So you'll have the lumen like this and then you'll have a layer of smooth muscle cells. They're kind of in a circular fashion like this. Then you have an outside layer where they're actually running at a 90 degree angle to this. So they're running kind of into and out of the screen. And so you have fibers like this It's kind of this second layer of smooth muscle cells. So you have a circular layer, and then you have a more longitudinal layer like this, and that's what you could be seeing here in cross-section. 
that's what you're observing here as well. So you see this section right here. The, these sheets of smooth muscle cells are actually running at a 90 degree angle to these. So these are running in this direction, and then these are actually running into and out of the screen. So they're, di they're at a 90 degree angle to this. And then here, this is where you can see circular smooth muscle cells in a artery where they surround the lumen. Smooth muscle cells, as we mentioned, they do not contain sarcomeres, so you're not gonna see any striations. That's a big difference between skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle cells. Some cellular features, they have actin microfilaments and then desmin inter intermediate filaments that are anchored to the sarcolemma. So the same, it's the same name here for the plasma membrane. So these filaments are anchored to the sarcolemma via dense bodies, and this is analogous to alpha actinin in the sarcomere structure within skeletal and cardiac muscle. They do rely on intracellular calcium for contraction, but in a different mechanism. So intracellular calcium activates contraction by binding to a protein called calmodulin, and we'll illustrate this in a figure on the next slide. Calmodulin then forms with calcium a calcium calmodulin complex, and then that complex activates an enzyme called myosin light chain kinase, which as in the name, it, it phosphorylates myosin, which then enables it to bind actin, and that's how you carry out contraction. So it does not involve troponin proteins. The sarcolemma doesn't form, by definition, T-tubules, but it forms similar structures called these pinocytotic invaginations called calveolae. So it's the same kind of thing. You're invaginating the membrane to help bring the depolarization deeper into the cell to further activate contraction. Another thing about smooth muscle cells is they have gap junctions, and that, again, helps, just like in cardiac muscle, facilitate serial propagation of the membrane depolarization. And the other thing about smooth muscle cells is they're triggered by neurotransmitters released from the endings of autonomic nerves. So again, there's no neuromuscular junction like there is in skeletal muscle. So here's a figure illustrating smooth muscle contraction. So again, you have L-type voltage-gated calcium channels that will allow calcium to come in and increase the intracellular calcium concentration. Calcium can then bind to calmodulin and you form the calcium calmodulin complex, which then comes down here and activates the enzyme myosin light chain kinase, which then phosphorylates myosin, which then enables myosin to bind to actin, and this is what gives you contraction. Now, on the flip side here, you have myosin light chain phosphatase, which then can remove this phosphate group, breaking up this interaction and allowing you to have smooth muscle relaxation. This is particularly important for vasodilation. So if you recall, you have your blood vessel like this, you can have vasoconstriction, which is where the smooth muscle layer of the blood vessel, particularly of an artery, will contract and the lumen will become smaller. And then you can have vasodilation, where the smooth muscle layer will relax and then you have opening of the lumen or a larger lumen for more blood flow to occur. Now, nitric oxide actually plays a key role here. So nitric oxide is a gas. It can diffuse across the membrane, and it increases levels of cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP then binds to myosin light chain phosphatase and activates it, and that triggers dephosphorylation of myosin to give you relaxation. So lastly here, smooth muscle cell regeneration. Smooth muscle cells can undergo hypertrophy or hypotrophy in response to changes in demand or concentrations of hormones. So if they're getting overstimulated, they can undergo hypertrophy, or if they're getting understimulated, they can undergo hypotrophy. They're also under, able to undergo hyperplasia via mitotic cell division. So this is unique for of the three muscle cell types because remember, skeletal and cardiac muscle cannot undergo mitosis but smooth muscle cell in certain scenarios can actually undergo mitosis. In addition to that, there's also these cells called pericytes, which are mesenchymal stem cells that are able to differentiate into smooth muscle cells within the basal lamina of capillaries and venules. So in these locations, you have these stem cells that can help generate new smooth muscle cells as well. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel to check out more histology videos and other medical education videos.